so so I I named this talk archiving history and social movement culture, but I'm actually going to go backwards. I'm going to start with so, social movement culture, hit on history, and then end with the archiving bit. Um, and part of this comes from the conversation, or at least the email exchange that Kevin and I had about uh, this presentation and about this this idea of of capital A art. Um, so, uh, social movement culture is a term that it, it very well may predate, but um, as far as I know, that Dara Greenwald, who, who um, Kevin mentioned and I um, coined in 2007, 2008, while we were putting together an exhibition called Signs of Change, uh, which was originally held at, at, at Exit Art uh, here in New York City and then traveled around the country. Um, and, and we sort of came to this term because we both had backgrounds, both collecting um, the, the sort of cultural material and ephemera and art produced by people who are organizing to transform their lives, but then also making it. And we were really interested in um, sort of telling a history of what we saw as this kind of art form or cultural form that developed post-war, War II, um, and, and sort of quickly spread across the world and was completely and profoundly um, and structurally uh, foundational for our understandings of ourselves in that this sort of material that came out of um, the historical avant-garde, but more importantly, out of the social movements that really developed autonomously from traditional political structures um, starting in the late 1950s uh, onward. And we really felt that the material that we were interested in um, this culture that was produced by groups of people organizing to transform their lives, their workplaces, their communities, um, was not effectively described when when called political art or activist art. That those terms uh, bring to mind the idea of an individual artist who is sort of expressing themselves around the ideas um, and sort of conceptions of a political or social issue, which is primarily not what social movement culture is. Um, and that to actually conflate these things does it does a great disservice to our understanding on how, on how social transformation happens. Um, and so we started to kind of try to build a taxonomy around what distinguished what we were calling social movement culture from what is more traditionally thought of as uh, political or activist art. And these are, this of course is not, these aren't discrete categories, but we felt that um, there was enough distinctions that it was pretty important to try to carve out um, this, this uh, unique territory um, of social movement culture. And, and not all pieces of social movement culture fit each of these things that I'm gonna describe, but often there'll be a number of overlapping uh, parts that, that, are, that connect to these ideas. And uh, one of them, and, and, and one of the most important ones is sort of a redefining of the idea autonomy within the cultural sphere that like traditionally within art context, autonomy is understood as the autonomy of the art object from the social conditions that produces it. And that the movement, uh, the culture produced in movements um, is, is in fact the exact opposite of that, um, that it is defined by the conditions that produce it. And that it actually makes no sense outside of those conditions. Um, and then secondarily that um, in part because of that, it's simultaneously demanding a political autonomy as opposed to a sort of an art autonomy that uh, this work often um, demands an identity outside of statecraft and capitalism. That we're more than citizens um, of nation states, that we're more than economic machines. Um, and it, this is an image by Charles Moore, uh, photograph 1963 um, of three civil rights uh, organizers being um, an activist being uh, hit with a water hose in, in uh, Alabama in the sort of peak of the civil rights movement. And um, I, I, I think this image is really a, a great one for understanding this question of what, what happens when you take um, a, a cultural activity, um, in this case, sort of a, an a activist performance in a way outside of its context. Outside of its context, this looks like three black bodies being victimized. Um, but then when you actually look at it within the context in which it was produced, these are activists who organized, went to meetings, um, 
and made very, very conscious decisions to go out onto the streets in places where they knew that they would more than likely be hit with water hoses um, because they wanted people like Charles Moore, who was a, a journalist and photographer who was white, to take this photograph and dis disseminate it around the world to document what was happening in the South. So this is a very elaborate piece of performance art in a certain context. Um, but if you strip away uh, the social conditions in which it was produced, then it loses all of that. Um, and it actually loses its meaning. And, and these people, in, in, in many ways, they lose their humanity. Um, another key sort of aspect here is the, the production of new social forms. Um, these are, these are uh, artists and housing activists in um, Denmark, in Copenhagen, who were part of a group called Schlumstormen, which was a uh, squatting kind of collective in the late 60s and early 70s who held an art show in 1971 that at the end of it turned into them breaking into and occupying a military barracks on the side of the city. That barracks um, is now known as the Freetown of Christiania and is the world's longest living uh, experiment in sort of a free society outside of the normal structures of statecraft. It's a squ massive squatted territory um, that people have now been in for 52 years. Uh, that actually evolved out of a series of organizing and cultural events. Um, and that you, you can't separate um, the sort of production of the space and its ongoing maintenance and development um, from it as a, as a sort of both cultural form and political form. Uh, this idea that the of completely and often um, totally redefining or upturning ideas of authorship, that the movement becomes a producer as opposed to the individual. So many times in moments of social upheaval, not only do you have often hundreds, if not thousands of people who don't consider themselves producers of culture actually taking part in that process, um, but you also have uh, sort of a complete redefining of roles, and you have this the, the the sort of erasure of traditional authorship as being something of meaning. This is an image uh, from South Africa. This is the Cape Town Arts Project in the early 1980s, um, which was one of multiple screen printing workshops that were developed as part of the anti-apartheid movement, in which originally set up with the idea that artists would produce posters for the movement the demand for the posters became so great that these almost immediately became training centers uh, where labor uh, organizers, uh, people representing women's groups, uh, left uh, religious organizations, student organizations would come in asking for posters and they would actually have to learn how to print them themselves to design, draw, burn screens and print them. Um, and, and literally, uh, hundreds of thousands of posters were made this way in the first half of the 1980s in South Africa. Um, that the, the idea of what's at stake really changes in a movement context. Um, you know, as as De La Soul has said, stakes is high. That that challenging power necessitates risk. Um, that art within these contexts is no longer a safe zone that can be retreated to. But it's actually a place in which you're just as much in danger um, as the people who are doing performing other roles within the movement. Um, this is a block print documenting the Gwangju uprising um, in 1980 in South Korea. And you can see there's these figures who are sort of surreptitiously printing leaflets. Um, and you have someone who's sort of uh, doing the printing, someone who's doing the drawing, someone who's doing the printing, someone who's sort of proofreading in the background, uh, a person who's got a stack of them who's going to take them out into the street, and then someone who's looking out the window. The, 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 the window shade is pulled dark and telling people, stop, we're going to be raided. Um, and that, you know, within these contexts of, of, of massive social upheaval, um, there's, a, there's a lot at stake. Um, the production of the culture that is communicating to the people what's going on uh, in the streets um, becomes of, of critical uh, necessity and therefore is a key point of repression. Um, th this concept of cacophony, that within a traditional art context, what gives art value is its scarcity. 
but within a movement context with what gives culture value is is it's it's excess um within a movement context there's never enough there's always more there always needs to be more um these are all images from nicaragua during the struggle um in the late 1970s and early 80s um of the Sandinistas uh, to overthrow the US backed regime. And these are, this is all street art and graffiti in which um, mostly, almost entirely untrained uh, people were making marks on walls as a way to communicate the struggle, um, both to the people that they were opposing um, as a threat and to the people that they were part of and supporting as a message that there are people here that believe the same thing as you, that we're all part of the struggle. Uh, and then finally, the idea of prefiguration, that within these forms of culture are sort of windows into the possibility of new worlds. Um, and, you know, there's there's so many examples of this, but, but often there's this conception that um, people who are involved in political movements are sort of late to, to catch on to sort of new ideas and new technologies. And more often than not, the exact opposite is true, that um, it's, it's actually within movement context that these new concepts of how things can be done or made, um, even within the realm of technology, uh, are experimented with and developed. Um, and there's a really uh, low-tech version of that on the screen here, which is the Provo in Amsterdam in 1966 and their white bike plan which was this idea that everyone should have access to free transportation. So that demanding the city of Amsterdam um, create a fleet of thousands of bikes, paint them white so that anyone and everyone throughout the city would, would be able to jump on a bike anywhere and, and ride it around the city and it would be free um, and accessible to all. Um, and now, of course, we know that this idea of the sort of accessible bicycle has now become one of the, you know, in a, a street level, a dominant marker of a neoliberal city, which is a place where you can put your credit card into a machine and pull out a bike that you can ride around. Um, and that that idea comes directly from social movements. Another great example of that is the text, where, text mob software that was developed for the RNC uh, here in New York City, which became, which was open source and became the core central aspect of the code that later became Twitter. Um, that these things were developed within movement contexts. Um, and, and I think that our, our, our sort of working through those ideas, and, and I should say again that a lot of this, uh, I didn't develop any of this on my own. This came through many, many conversations, not only with Dara Greenwald, but with other uh, Interference Archive collaborators and founders like Kevin Kaplicki and Molly Fair, um, and now Jen Hoyer, but then also through you know, lots of volunteers and interference, lots of other Just Seeds members. Um, it's really sort of a, a collective development of intellectual um, ideas. And out of that is, is this idea that our collective history belongs in the commons, that the history that we produce together, we should all together have access to. Um, but there are things that stand in the way of that. Uh, and one is really this idea of history. What is history and how is it utilized? Um, we live in, a, in, you know, under late capitalism in a context in which um, almost all imagery, sound, culture uh, that is generated is mobilized in order to maintain the status quo. And so we get things like, I, I love using advertisements to, to talk about these things. Here's this, this uh, advertisement for Virgin, uh, a Virgin Money early app um, in which we go far, far back into the past where we're, you know, where there are mastodons, yet we still have to worry about the social conditions uh, and construction of today. So we're riding a woolly mammoth, but we're worried about get, being carjacked. Um, and then we jump uh, to the future with like this diesel ad, global warming ready, um, in which everything is gonna be underwater, but we'll still get to be sexy and wear cool jeans. Um, so, uh, you know, everything that is important uh, gets maintained, that the status quo uh, is kept uh, as we understand it, that social conditions don't fundamentally um, evolve or develop or get overturned. And, and this sort of trapping of history creates this, what I, I like to think of as this funhouse mirror in which everywhere we look, there's just this everlasting variations on what we have now. Um, so everything is in this monolithic idea of the present can't be changed because everything before and everything after is the same. And this is where using history, not as a mechanism, the status quo, but as a tool 
um, that we can use to actually show that in the past, things actually have been different, that social conditions have changed. And once we can understand that that transformation can happen, that it opens up the present to all different possible futures. We're no longer trapped in this fun house. But in order for history to function as a tool like that, then people need to actually have access to it and be able to sort of use it and wield it and take the ideas out of it and redeploy them in the present. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things that get in the way of that. And, and in, in the realm of archives, um, I, I like to think that there are these sort of four horsemen of the archival apocalypse, institutional ignorance, undercapitalization, privatization, and well-meaning artists. And I'll go through them, through them one by one. Um, within this sort of idea of institutional ignorance, uh, basically the, the culture that's produced by social movements because of these conditions that I've described often become, becomes uh, largely invisible traditional institutional archival structures. And so within um, uh, university contexts, um, educational contexts, archives, often tend to privilege uh, secondary source materials like people writing about movements rather than the objects that came out of those movements themselves, both because they're easier to, um, to, to archive and store um, and to, to basically give students access to, but also because there tends to not be enough focus on and understanding of the way that those objects have functioned in movements. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, my friend Lincoln Cushing, um, who's a radical archivist on the West Coast uh, ha has often said that, you know, we live in a country in which there's uh, hundreds, um, there's, sorry, thousands and thousands of um, art history departments, but as far as he knows, there's not a single professor of the political poster anywhere. Um, and then when you go into the context of art ar art archives, then um, you have the this problem of uh, the sort of fundamental nature of movement culture overturning conceptions of authorship going against the grain of what actually upholds and valorizes um, the art institution. And so these are actually two post-it notes that I found on the pad archives in MoMA in Queens when I went and sort of bullied my way um, behind the curtain by convincing the archivist that I knew more about what they had in the collection than, than she did. Um, let me into the back and into the flat files. And I found these post-it notes on flat files of political posters, um, uh, miscellaneous posters to be cataloged last or whenever, um, posters that are literally quote unquote, not cool enough to catalog. Um, and these were post-it notes on flat files of black liberation posters, American Indian movement posters, early environmental movement and climate justice posters. All of them, um, you know, indiscernible um, to art archivists because they had cherry picked out everything that had a known artist's name or signature on it, or that they could recognize as having some tangential connection to the traditional art world and everything else literally sunk to the bottom of the files. Um, under capitalization, that often the people that have been in the institutions or counter institutions that have been the best at collecting these histories are the people that participated in them. Um, and because they're so connected to movements, they're often terribly and fundamentally undercapitalized. This is a photograph of a basement archive in Rome um, uh, beneath the uh, anarchist bookstore on, on an Anomalia. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, this is just like basically the history of anarchism in Italy and the autonomous movement in Italy in the 1970s in just stacks and stacks of rolled posters, all rolled up, not flat, corners torn, um, piles and piles of paper and books just shoved onto shelves with literally just no capital and no sort of labor force to, to not only maintain this stuff, but to actually make it viewable or accessible to anyone. Um, and this kind of story happens over and over again, particularly in, in other parts of the world, in the global South where, um, they're just, uh, you know, there's just not enough money um, for these these histories to be maintained, and that they're sort of unfortunately actively being lost. Um, the third of the horsemen is privatization, and as an extension of that, private collectors. Um, this is a screenshot of the eBay page of of posters, Cuban posters from OSPAL, the Organization of Solidarity of the Peoples of Africa, Asia, uh, and Latin America. 
produced some of the most beautiful political posters, but also most collectible, at least post-World War II. And so you can see that these posters in this, I took this screenshot you know, five or six years ago. So some of these posters are going for $1,500. Then now we're talking about $2,500, $3,000, $5,000 for these posters. Uh, And and what this does is not only do these things get hoovered um, up and put into private collections where no one can access them, but also what gives something value within a private collection are is up to the whim of the collector. And the nature of private collectors, not exclusively, but largely is, is, is the sort of the nature of collecting, which means that they're always interested in the, the sort of most rare, the hardest to get thing, the sort of jewel in the collection. Um, but the reality is, it's the things that have been most important to most people on the street and movements are actually the things that are the most accessible, that were produced in the highest volume. And so when you have movements and movement histories being organized and sort of curated by individual collectors, there's this distortion of the history in which the thing that is the most rare gets sort of pride of place. Um, when in fact, oftentimes, those are the things that very few people on the ground in movements ever saw, never mind were influenced by. And so it really kind of can distort our understanding of the way that history functions, um, never mind larger questions of access. Uh, and then finally, um, I don't have a slide for it, but the sort of well-meaning artist. Um, I mean, sadly, we've reached the point where um, it's it's hard to 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 run into that many contemporary artists that don't have a project that falls under the name of archive at this point. Um, you know, you throw a rock and you hit an artist, uh, any artist that sort of went to the beach and collected a bunch of seashells and is renamed at the archive of the ocean's infinite greatness or some such uh, grandiose thing in which there's a sort of profound misunderstanding of the difference between a collection and an archive. Um, and within within our context, and and that does disservice uh, in a number of ways. Um, one, the sort of like violence of language that happens within our discourse, uh, where you have individual institutions um, or collectives of one, um, when like you know, there's no such thing as a collective of one. We have so few terms in the English language to define or uh, understand what it means to function socially, to actually undermine those by calling yourself as an individual, a collective or a cooperative or all of these things that I feel un is unconscionable. Um, so, so like the idea that just because you collected a bunch of stuff makes you an archivist. Um, well, certainly it's possible that you could become one that is not you know, preordained. And, and it does a really large disservice to sort of the, the actual labor of what it takes to build an institution or a counter institution that functions in archive that actually gives people access to things. Um, and that like makes a collection or a series of collections open, transparent, available. Um, and that this is not necessarily and more often than not, not something that functions as an artist project. Um, and then to sort of like jump off these things, I think that the the sort of protectors or the things that we can use to fight off this these horsemen um, are uh, are the creation of archives that are open and accessible, democratic, politically engaged, and fundamentally social. And then I'm just gonna very quickly go through Interference Archive um, next five, six minutes uh, so that we can get to Q&A as just one potential example of how some of these questions can be addressed. Um, Interference Archive uh, is a public facing archive in a storefront space in the Park Slope neighborhood of Brooklyn. Um, it was founded in 2011 um, by four people, um, myself, uh, Dara Greenwald, Molly Fair, and Kevin Kablicki. Um, I'm the only one at this point who's still actively involved, and even I am relatively marginal to to the day-to-day -day functioning of the archive, which which is is a great thing. Um, it exists as a counter institution outside the people that initially conceptualized it, and very much has a life of its own. Um, and and you know we like to think of ourselves as a counter institution. That like if you look at a traditional archive, it looks like something. Um, for the most part, uh, that you would see here on the left, and that we instead 
want our space and archive, archive to look like the right. Uh, a space that's filled with bodies, that's filled with the social, that's filled with people that are always um, actually taking the things that are being archived and, and taking the ideas out of them and transforming them into new things. Um, we function as a, a social uh, archive of social movement culture, an exhibition and an event venue, public reading room, research center, uh, and shared work and meeting space. And then I'll sort of go through a bunch of images that hit on uh, these different uh, functions or ideas. Um, one, I mean, interference is a, is a, a phenomenal place to, to sort of interact with this idea of cacophony that I mentioned earlier. This is, this is just one little cell phone photo um, of a collection of buttons that we received pretty early on uh, in, in interference's history in which there was a uh, ring on the doorbell. Um, someone went, ran to get the door, opened the door, and there was a person who said, here, do you want these? And shoved a trash bag full of um, political buttons uh, into their hands and then said, see ya, and, and, and walked away. Um, and then, you know, we brought this bag in and dumped it out on a table. And we basically add the history of social movements in New York City from the early 1970s and sort of like the movement for the Panther 21 up to uh, the Occupy movement, um, all, all in political buttons. And political buttons are sort of great example of, uh, of movement culture because there's something that are sort of looked down on or not thought of as being sort of high art, they're fully functional. Um, yet that this is sort of amazing object uh, when seen um, in collection, as, as this, they, they truly are things that tend to express people's political positions within movements because they're things that people made decisions to wear. Um, and so they, they become an extension of people's in, internal and organized politics. Um, uh, here in the top left, you've got an image of, a, of an early uh, political talk and conversation that we had with some comrades from Argentina. Um, uh, on the top right is a, a still of an image from uh, one of our radical play dates, which was a series of kids programming that we did for about five years um, that we're hoping to sort of relaunch again. I think this was from uh, the kids had made the, at the tail end of the kids had made uh, posters, placards, and then had marched around the block with them. Um, the bottom uh, left is from um, a dance performance that was done uh during um an exhibition that we had on political music um called if, if a song could be freedom and then on the bottom uh right here is ryan wong who is the organizer and curator of a show called serve the people about the history of the asian american movement in new york city giving a walking tour of um, the history of the asian american movement in chinatown um, and then these are um, the covers of zines that were produced out of interviews that we did for our most recent exhibition called Defend to Fund, which is uh, a kind of history of organizing against police uh, in the United States and particularly in New York City, um, which will be up through the rest of the year. And then these accompany uh, another um, exhibition catalog that documents the show. Um, this is an image of a cataloging party. And so all of the the sort of functions or most of the functions that happen within um, traditional archiving contexts, we try to find out, figure out ways to make them more social. And so rather than having professional archivists catalog the material in our collection, we have these things which are called cataloging parties where we have uh, people come in with laptops and we pull boxes off the shelves and people pull those things out um, and then use the collective knowledge in the room to try to catalog those objects. Um, to say like where they came from and and um, what they are and and what their their context and, and meaning is, and so they become these kind of nice raucous affairs where someone will hold up something and say, "Hey, does anyone know anything about this beyond what's written on it?" And sort of this sort of great conversations come out of that and a sort of collective knowledge base. Um, we also do Wikipedia editathons in which we take our collection off the shelf and use it to bolster the sort of collective um, hive mind within Wikipedia using the kind of specific movement culture that we have in our collection from, um, and those started with the art and feminism Wikipedia um, editathons, but then we've done them around a whole bunch of social issues from indigenous resistance um, to, uh, Think of we've had a half dozen. I think we we did one actually around um, uh, 
uh, abolition and, and um, prisons and policing. Um, we also have a robust education program where we bring kids in everywhere from middle school up through um, you know, doctoral uh, students. Um, and you know, at, at, its, at its peak, the program will, will bring in two or three class visits a week. Uh, one of the things that happened with COVID is that the, um, that all got shut down, but one of the, the unexpected kind of upsides was that we started doing virtual class visits. And so we ended up having classes from as far flung as Tokyo, Manchester, um, uh, other parts of Europe who all got to do virtual tours of the archive, something that we probably would have never thought of if we hadn't been sort of physically unable to congregate within the space. Uh, we have a, a robust um, podcast program called Audio Interference, which has sort of been restructuring of late, but I think has done almost 100 uh, podcasts. There's a massive archive of these podcasts um, up on Stitcher and, and, and um, the, the Apple podcast app and all the places where people can get podcasts. If you look up Audio Interference, you'll find that collection. And these are often like people will come in to donate things and we ask them like, were you, were you part of making these things? And they say, yes. And so we sit down and we have a conversation with them and we document it and put together a podcast about the movements that the objects came from. Um, and uh, you know, one of our, our big watchwords is we are who we archive. Um, that like the archive can't be separate from the movements that there needs to be a structure of accountability. Um, and that we're always in sort of formation of figuring out what that looks like and what that means. And, and part of that is, is having a funding structure that, come, that, that uh, is also accountable. And so, um, you know, oftentimes people say things were sort of built from care, but in the case of Interference Archive, it's actually literally true that the original funding structure for Interference came out of a care circle that was developed for Derek Greenwald, one of the founders who, um, while interference was being set up, was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and so we transitioned the program that was developed around her care into a mechanism for um, funding the archive. So she asked the people, she, she passed away in early 2012, and um, she asked the people who were supporting her if they could um, transition their support to the archive. And we, we set up a membership base that fluctuates between 100 and 150 people who give anywhere from five to $50 a month to support the archive. And that's always been the core of our funding. Um, being that we're in New York City, that cannot pay the rent, unfortunately, but it's always been something that we've maintained and we've thought of as a, as a key part of our programming. Um, is that having a relationship to the funders um, and, and sort of trying to develop funding, knowing that like, if we're not doing things that people are interested in, then they'll stop supporting us. Um, and, then, and then to end it, uh, here's, here's our sandwich board that we put out in front of the archive every day when we're open, um, 314 7th Street, interferencearchive.org. And I encourage anyone and everyone when they're in New York City to come and visit. We're currently open Monday through um, I mean, Friday through Monday, and you can find the hours on the website and, and please come and check us out. And so I'll, I'll end it there and um, we'll see if we have any questions um, and kick it back to, to Kevin. Hey, well, thanks. That was, um, looks, looks like I'm freezing up here a little bit, but um... Uh, that was really uh, a remarkable presentation, and I have a lot of. There's no questions in the Q and A yet, and um, I, I, I ha I've developed a kind of a hectoring tone, I think, in my chat, encouraging people to to ask questions. But I really I don't want to monopolize the the time that we have remaining. We have 20 minutes, so if you have questions um, for Josh or comments or anything, please put them in the Q and A. I see a few people had raised their hands, but. Um, Unfortunately, this venue, um, I can't call on people when you raise your hand. So um, just put your question in the in the Q&A and I'll, I'll get to it later. I mean, it's hard for me to know exactly where to start with this. I, I, I would like to have two hours um, um, minimum just to, to, to begin to, to talk about and ask questions and, 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 and pursue some of the things that you raised um, here. Um, I think the question of access is one that really 
is on my mind a lot right now from where I'm sitting. And um, um, it kind of leaps over the whole question of what is the purpose of access? What is the purpose of um, of preserving this material? What is the hope for it? And, and, and all of that. Um, those are huge, big questions that that problematize the whole notion of an archive, I think, in ways that that I would really love to talk with you about. Um, but um, just in terms of access and your, your your kind of conversation about you know the 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 the, the post-it notes that you found um, on on uh, material in the archive, and it's 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 an issue that. Um, I live with every day, and it's really kind of um, at Beinecke right now, um, uh, where I'm a curator and have been collecting uh, protest culture for um, in the last 15, 20 years, um, has, has kind of led me to a crisis point um, where um, the material um, that you talk about and you say, you know, the problem with um, university uh, uh, archives often is that they don't really collect the objects. Um, the reason for that is that it's so difficult to um, to uh, for us to actually handle them, you know, to bring them in and handle them. I just brought an archive um, to committee this week um, that is one of the most amazing, astounding archives I've ever seen in my life. And it's filled with um, artwork as well as, um, um, you know, um, uh, this is a, an archive from the 60s and 70s. Um, it's full of um uh, uh these are experimental filmmakers among other things and they're so they're real to real tape and there's and there's there's reels of film and it's all completely unique material and i'm having to fight for the idea that yes we can bring this here and we can actually handle it and do something with it um but the other part of it is just you know what do you catalog first and what do you you know um and 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 the the constant battles that i fight there on that front because difficult material um you know is the material that that often ends up being pushed over into a corner and not not dealt with so um uh, I guess I, there's some questions piling up here so i i think i want to get to those um but the question i, I mean the, the, the sort of thing that, that, that I come back to here, and again, it links into the politics of archiving, is just uh, the question you also mentioned of um, resources. And, uh, you know, Beinecke is probably one of the best endowed um, uh, archives uh, the, uh, of, uh, of this kind of material anywhere uh, that I can imagine. I mean, we have, you know, a huge staff of uh, professional archivists who work you know, full time and, um, and and all of this and and we're and yet I have a crisis of conscience feeling like I can't acquire continue to acquire material because we can, I can't be a good steward of it. I can't make it accessible in the way that you're talking about. So um, um, you, you talked a bit about the funding and the, the ways you get around it with the catalog uh, cataloging parties and, and, and things like that. But I just, you know, at some point be really interested in following up with you because I have this 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 article in mind called the political uh towards a political economy of archiving protest culture where I kind of you know there's some uncomfortable truths in there about the, the amount of infrastructure uh, you need to do it properly and to really ensure the uh, safety and access of the material in the long run um well I mean I think the real real quick just a couple of things in, in direct response I mean, we we have sort of borrowed a phrase that I think originally came from Rick Perlinger um, in the Perlinger Archive, which is that use is preservation, um, and and that we're less interested in the stuff <laughs> and more interested in the ideas that are embedded within the stuff, and that. Um, if people can't actually access things and take those ideas out back out into the world, then it's just a pile of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and who cares? I mean, at the end of the day, like if you, so, so access becomes for us becomes primary. I mean, we, we have the privilege on a certain level of, of, largely guessing that we'll want everything we collect was produced in multiple. So we don't have like personal papers and things like that. Um, and two, that like there's probably redundancy. So there there are copies in 
more retentive collections that where people aren't being allowed to touch them. Mm -hmm. But like one of the conditions for things coming into interference is that if you can't touch it without it falling apart, then we don't really want it. Um, because for us, like, like we have a huge, we have a relatively large collection of, for instance, like Black Panther Party newspapers, mm -hmm. um, which like on the open market now are hundreds of dollars. Um, but we just let anyone walk in the door and take them out and look at them and read them. Because for us, like a 15 year old kid who maybe aunt or uncle was a Panther, but has not been able to have access to this history. Mm -hmm. If they tear a page in the process of going through one of those papers, that's a small price to pay. Mm -hmm. um, that like the, the it's a, a weighing of cost benefit um, and that actually access almost always has weighs heavier on the benefit than preservation. And that like most of a significant number of the volunteers in interference actually are professional archivists. And my eyes were really open when one of them, um, we were giving a tour of the archive and they were telling students, my day job is actually working in a rare book vault in another institution in the city. And one of my jobs is emptying the bucket underneath the leak in the ceiling. <laughs> And that the reality is, is that even institutions that are from the outside present as being the sort of stewards of preservation, there's a, they have a leak in the ceiling in rooms where there are, in, there are you know, illuminated manuscripts that are thousands of years old. Um, and that this sort of idea of preservation oftentimes institutionally is also just a facade. Yeah, well, I could talk about uh, leaks and and water and floods at Beinecke too. I probably shouldn't, but um, but just suffice it to say that it leads to a real crisis. And again, it leads to the question where we're paralyzed into not being able to collect yeah. because we don't have the space that is you know Beinecke is um, is built on a uh, on, on top of a swamp and. Uh, under uh, you know is below the water table and the, the whole thing is underground so you can imagine there, there are all sorts of issues and with climate change and everything we're really you know um, so we're running up against a lot of that but um, um, let me uh, let me jump to some of the questions we have first of all from uh, Melinda Hunt who asks um, is the collection uh, is the collection archived online that is archived online do you have access to it online um, we, our collection probably has, I don't know, at this point, 200 to 300,000 objects in it. Um, maybe 15,000 of those are catalogs. Um, uh, right now our catalog is actually, it, it was embedded on our website, but because of software issues, it, it's currently not accessible. Um, this is a this is again an undercapitalization issue, um, and and one I also think that there's a I, I don't know I I don't want to presume or assume anything about the person who's asking the question, but um, we very much privilege and focus on people accessing the physical objects. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are, there's geographic limitation to that. It's, it's mostly for people who are in New York City. Um, I mean, thankfully, maybe or not, but for better or for worse, New York City is one of the great airports of the world. And so um, people are coming in and out from all over the place. So in, in that way, it does make it a little bit more accessible than if we were this kind of collection in a small town somewhere that was hard to get to. But we accept, in a way, we accept that as a limitation. Um, we're less, we just, we're not techno fetishists. We fundamentally have decided that like we, we have limitations and that the amount of investment necessary for the functional tech to have a full online collection is something that like, is really only generally reserved for the kind of most elite of institutions at this point. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who are working on that. It's just not been a focus. Uh, that The reality is, is that for the most part, the internet is a, just maybe the worst archive ever <laughs> created. Um, and, and the reality is, is that we can scan everything, um, but 
when you do that, you take on a level of investment that we just don't necessarily have the capacity for. People think you scan something and then you're done. Mm -hmm. But without thinking about migrating file formats, without thinking about the need to store all of that data and that the standard for what that format that data is in is always changing. Um, and then the, the, the interface for how to make that actually accessible online is also ever evolving and changing to increasingly more and more sort of either expensive privatized solutions or theoretically open source, but almost impossible to use alternatives. Mm -hmm. So like, I am really not a techno fetishist um, that, and I've learned more and more at interference and elsewhere. Like if I have a political poster um, and I put it in the bottom of a flat file um, in a hundred years, someone's going to open up that flat file and look at it and they'll functionally know kind of what it is and be able to discern it. If I scan that thing and put it on a hard drive and then put that hard drive in the bottom of a flat file in a hundred years, that hard drive is, is a drink coaster no one's going to know what the fuck it is um, or how to access it. Um, that you actually take on a, a huge level of, of responsibility financially and labor wise, once you start digitizing things, which like as an all volunteer organization, we just don't have the capacity for. Yeah. Well, who does? I mean, even like I said, you know, who does? Right, which is it's why we'd thing. rather just have kids come in and touch stuff. Yeah. Well, and I also, you know, I mean, my own feeling is that the digital surrogate is no substitute, you know, and that a lot of what I'm trying to teach with, with the material, what I want people to be able to explore with the material is linked to its physical uh, format. And the whole question of whether digitization is about democratization, which is one of your one of your primary, um, you know, goals with with the interference archive, as you as you as you put it. I, um, I I see that it is, um, but I also see that there's the other side of it, which has a tendency to, you know, um, to to render invisible the vast majority of uh, archival material, which will never be scanned. And, and so people just assume that if it's not online, it doesn't exist. And and that 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 means that a lot of voices are just, you know, permanently extinguished and, and people tend to share the same scans over and over again. No, so, um, but here I go again. Um, we're running out of time. Um, uh, uh, all right. So um, we have a question. Uh, do you see political graphics and posters playing a role in some of the current social and political movements we're seeing, such as Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ+, uh, uh, environmental movements? Um, big question. Another one um, uh, is actually, are most of the material scanned? So that that's kind of, uh, and does your archive interface with other institutions, which is what we we're just talking about. Then um, a definitely broad question, uh, but do you think institutional archives can ever be accessible, especially those in the US uh, when universities within the status quo are so often inaccessible to begin with? Um, and that's, that's a question that I'd, I'd really be interested in, in hearing your thoughts about. Um, uh, and also the thoughts of the anonymous person who, who, who submitted it uh, to us. But um, so there's uh, three, um, jo uh, Greg Cholette is on here and asks, um, did you say you're working on a finding system for some of the um, materials at the interference? And it sounds like you've answered that kind of already too in the, You've got some software issues with the catalog uh, that you've you've got. I, mean, I think more important than that is I think that we're we're moving towards trying to develop a series of finding aids, mm -hmm. uh, and then the reality we've long kind of come to accept is that to do research at Interference Archive is basically to volunteer at Interference Archive. <laughs> um, that we we don't have the capacity to pre-digest material for researchers, and so what we really need is people who are willing to take the time and energy because they care not only on their about their research subject, but about the sort of model that we're organizing around to, to sort of translate the time that they spend in the collection, say they're doing uh, research on housing struggles to help us build a finding aid. Um, and so like really working with the people who are using the archive to build resources that will be useful to, to other people who come and use it after them. Um, I mean, we already do that with, you know, this sort of question of scanning is that 
um, when people come in, we, we allow anyone to take photographs or scan things. We just, we don't claim to own the rights to those things. So it's up to the person who does that then to decide what they're going to do with it, but we're not going to police the sort of, um, the capturing of the material. But when people do scan things, we have them, we have a dedicated scanner and a laptop. And so we, we capture all of those things so that then we can use them. So anything that anyone who comes into the space and scans becomes a scan that goes into the sort of cataloging process. Right. I mean, that's not streamlined and it's messy, but it's it's been something that we do. Um, in terms of um, this, this uh, I mean, I don't want to talk too much more about the digital stuff and online. I mean, I think that the reality is, if we're honest with ourselves, is the the internet is largely a giant graveyard of websites that no one goes to, um, and that the primary ways to find those websites are proprietary search engines that weight um, what we find based on algorithms that we have little or no control over and are largely toxic to our humanity, and so. That's a little hyperbolic, but the reality is it's just because something's online doesn't mean that it's accessible. Um, and so to invest an immense amount of time and energy putting things up there that no one can find seems like a, a difficult way to decide to, to organize labor. Um, so um, just question. Your, yeah, do you remember oh, the other and then, so, so like we tend to, to really focus on accessibility uh, in an in-person or an embodied way. And so for us, that means like, you know, we are like one right around the corner from a busy active commercial strip, um, Fifth Avenue in Park Slope um, in central Brooklyn. And, and so the idea is that we're a space that people walk in off the street, which happens all the time, particularly over the weekend. Um, and people walk in and they're like, what is this place? Which is the perfect question. Um, and there's always volunteers there who are there to explain what it is. And the reality is, is that most people who walk in can find some sort of recognition of themselves in the material in the space. And we don't distinguish in the space, and I didn't have a lot of interior images, but we don't distinguish between exhibition space, workspace, collection space. These are all threaded in to each other. Um, so that when someone walks in, they see part of an exhibition, they see archival boxes, they see people working at desks, um, that, that that's part of the nature of what, what it means for an archive to be social. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, that unfortunately, most educational institutions and universities in this country really don't have that kind of access. They're like here in New York City, there's a place like Tamman at NYU, which is, you know, the labor collection which is one of the few places on NYU campus that nominally anyone is supposed to be able to walk into and have access to. But the reality is, is that if you're like a 14 year old kid who's interested in doing research on something like, like the Black Panthers, like we talked about, are you gonna have the wherewithal to know that that's there, to be able to navigate the armed guard uh, at the door? You need to have ID. You need to sort of like be able to talk your way in and make make them feel you know confident enough to tell them I actually can go up there that I don't need to have credentials or things like that. I mean that's a lot to ask, um, yes. and yes. and so we've just tried to strip as much of that away as possible. By you know, it's in, it's interesting that when I was there, the brief time that I was there last August, it was. You know, someone came in who had been walking past your your storefront um, for for quite a long while. I think before she had the courage to to come in there. So, and yeah. then it was obvious that you know, well, what do I do here, and what can I, you know? So, you know, the fact that you're facing those kinds of issues. I mean, it, in a place like Beinecke, which is a, a fantastic institution, beautiful building. But it looks for all the world like a safe from the outside. And yeah, when you come in, then there's uh, um, there's the security um, people and and all of that you have to get get through. So um, it, I wish we I wish we could dig into this some more. And I hope we'll have uh, chances um, um, uh, in some other in in, uh, in some other uh, venue.